Hi, this is Brad Keithley, Managing Director of Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. Welcome to the weekly top three, the top three things on our mind here at Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets for the week of September 10th, 2018. The weekly top three is a regular segment on the Michael Duke Show. I join Michael on the show each Tuesday morning, now from 6.20 to 7 a.m., for a discussion between the two of us about our three issues. The show broadcasts on Facebook Live and via streaming audio from the show's website weekdays from 6 to 8 a.m. We post the podcast of our discussion following the show on the Alaska for Sustainable Budgets Facebook, YouTube, and SoundCloud pages, and on my website at bgkeithley.com. You can find past episodes of the weekly top three also at the same locations. Keep in mind that in addition to these podcasts during the week, you also can follow and participate in the discussion with us of these and other issues affecting Alaska's fiscal and economic condition by following us on the Alaska for Sustainable Budgets Facebook page and through our posts on Twitter. This week's show is a deep dive into both federal and state fiscal issues. Maya McGinnis of the Committee for a Responsible Federal Budget joins Michael in the first segment to talk about federal fiscal issues. Then we join in the second to focus on state issues. Because there is a significant connection between the two discussions, we include both segments in this podcast. Our segment focuses on these three issues. First, following up on Maya's discussion, why we believe Alaska's fiscal situation in many respects is, unfortunately, a mirror image of the situation at the federal level. Second, now that oil prices and production levels are recovering, why we believe refilling the Constitutional Budget Reserve or CBR, should become a priority. And third, what it's going to take from a budget standpoint to preserve the PFD over the long term. And now, let's join Michael. Welcome back to the Michael Duke Show. Common Sense Radio is what we do each and every day, and we like to take on some of these bigger issues. And today is no different. Today we get a chance to focus on the national stuff. And as we've said in the past, as goes the nation, so goes the state of Alaska, uh, because it's kind of a monkey see, monkey do thing. And uh, this is really a big issue in regards to uh, uh, both national and state issues, and that is the state of spending in the United States. As I was saying before we went to break, we have done more in the last 15 years to damage the overall economy due to our spending for, and again, whether it's this president or every president that has you know come in the last 35 years, they have all advocated in one way or another for this excessive irresponsible spending, which, of course, has led us to do all kinds of foolish things. Maya McGinnis is the president of the Committee for a Responsible Federal Budget, as well as the head of the Campaign to Fix the Debt. She has areas of expertise that include budget tax and economic policy You'll find her regularly in front of Congress uh, dis discussing and testifying on these issues. And by the Wall Street Journal, she was once dubbed the anti-deficit warrior. And again, remember I said earlier, there's a difference between debt and deficit, and you should know what it is, and maybe Maya and I will get into that. Maya McGinnis joins us right now. Good morning. Good morning. It's nice to be with you. Well, I appreciate you coming on board. This is uh, this is a deep dive issue. I, I told people that before we got started, they needed to bring out their slide rules and their pencils because we're about to get That's into right. some we're about <laughs> to get into some heavy stuff here. Um, let's talk for just a minute uh, about uh, you know there's a, there's one problem I think that we have here in the United States. Well, there's many problems, but I think one of the biggest problems that we have is that, you know, they keep saying, well, we got revenue this, shortfall that, taxation this. You know, the question becomes, and I think this is both a national and a state issue for us, do we have a revenue problem, Maya, or do we have a spending problem in our governments in the United States? Right. So great question. I think the answer is we have a debt problem. What we have, and I actually think the national debt at this point uh, reflects another problem we have, which is we have a broken Congress that is unable to resolve tough issues. But what we have is a Congress uh, made up of Republicans and Democrats who are doing an increasingly poor job of working together on anything. And you have one party that much prefers smaller government and wants tax cuts, and one party that prefers bigger government and wants spending increases, but nobody who actually wants to pay for those policies. 
Right. There's, and so yeah. the issue, I mean, it's okay. So we're a nonpartisan organization. I'm a political independent. It's totally legitimate to want more spending or less spending. But what's not legitimate is to say, give me huge tax cuts or spending increases and give that bill to my kids. Right. And that's what the national debt is. That's, that's the unwillingness to pay for it. So it's the, uh, the actual budgeting part. We're skipping over and we're doing real damage to the economy. Well, and I think that's a lot of people don't understand. I mean, because I think people I can identify with and analogizing the government to a household is not always an apples to apples comparison. But people can understand that, you know, you have money that comes in, you have money that goes out, you have a household budget. You know that you have to at least have an idea of what you're spending things on. Uh, But in this this country, I mean, we haven't had an actual budget in like 14 years. I mean, it's a continuing resolution. Uh, nobody's actually laying out what we're supposed to be doing. And that's a real problem. And as you said, there doesn't appear to be any political will to fix that important part of how we take care of our system. Yeah, the budget process and the fact that we don't even pass a budget for the single largest entity in the world is it should be stunning and kind of a showstopper for everybody right there. Any CEO, even of the smallest business, would be fired if they didn't have a budget in place. Because what that does is it lays out the blueprint for where you're headed. And it's in a budget that you actually grapple with that first question you asked. Do we want more spending or less? Do we want lower taxes or higher taxes? And how much are we willing to borrow? Uh, Hopefully not too much. But what happens in Congress, and very few people even realize this process, is they don't get the budget done more often than not these days. And like you said, in the end, they either end up shutting down the government or go through this last minute scramble where everything is stuffed into these huge omnibus packages. Nobody knows what's getting spent. And the big problem on the spending side of the budget is twofold. It's one that there's always pressure to spend more and Congress constantly caves to that pressure. We just had a huge, a massive spending increase bill that passed. None of it was offset. But the second problem with spending is we have so much built-in spending in the budget, programs that were put there years and decades ago that are completely out of control, headed towards insolvency. And I'm talking about Social Security and Medicare here. And nobody is willing to roll up their sleeves and say, we have to make these programs solvent again. There's a variety of ways to fix them, but we have to do something. So you have automatic out-of-control spending in our biggest programs and then new spending that Congress passes each year. And then, as you remarked, no budget. Really, no no business person would ever be able to get away with that. And yet there's no budget. There's no budget in place right now. Well, and, and we even see even the smallest reduction. Uh, I think it was Rand Paul that had the uh, had the, the bill up that basically would have reduced one penny out of every dollar spent. Uh, and I don't think it was even in one year. It was over the course of a couple of years where they would reduce one penny out of every dollar spent. And even that couldn't get any traction in this Congress. Uh, You know, nobody would embrace it. And and I think that's just that's a problem. And as much as, again, I'm a libertarian, so I'm with you kind of on this. I try and tackle each uh, question as it comes on on an individual basis. You know, even with President Trump saying he wants to drain the swamp and he's done some good things on regulations and other things. But Mm -hmm. even he is embracing these larger spending packages and everything else. And that becomes the core issue. You can rave about tax cuts all you want, but if you just continue to increase the spending, you are dooming not just our children, as you said, but our children's children. Well, what you're doing is you're jeopardizing our position in the global economy and the world order as being the leading strongest nation. Right. No country is able to maintain its position of power when it becomes over indebted. And that is something that on our current course we are headed to. And you just kind of scratch your head and say, why would we give up our great position and advantages of being the strongest, most nimble, freest country there is um, because we want to consume so much now and not pay for it and leave the, the country much weaker? Um, And I also want to go to another point that you made. I think this is such an important point, and it's one that we just went through with the huge debate about the tax cuts we had. There was absolutely no question we need to reform our tax code. It was a mess in so many ways. It was way too complicated, outdated, and very anti-competitive. But if what your goal is is to cut taxes because you want smaller government, you can't just cut taxes. 
because then you're just borrowing, your interest payments are growing, which is what's happening now. You're making someone else pay for it. You have to cut spending. Right. If what you want is smaller government, you don't get that by tax cuts. That's just not paying your bills. You get that by spending cuts. And so if people want a smaller, and again, I said, I'm an independent. Some people want bigger government. Some people want smaller government. I, I think everybody's entitled to their own preference, but you should back it up with the policies. And so if you want a smaller government, you need to go to your politicians and say, I want you to cut spending. And after you've done that, then you can cut taxes. But you can't just say, I'm going to let those bills pile up and not pay them. That's what we're doing right now. And it, it really is a recipe for both economic disaster um, and, and, again, giving up this, this position of strength that this country has. We need to have a strong balance sheet for the emergencies and threats that come along in a very kind of challenging changing economy that we're all in the midst of with with huge changes in the workforce and technology. I don't know why we want to go in with both arms uh, tied behind our backs. Maya McGinnis is our guest. She's the president for the Committee for a Responsible Federal Budget. You could find them, by the way, at cfrb.org. Uh, Maya, I mean, again, talking. CRFB. CR, C- I'm sorry. That's it's right. CRFB. It's the it worst is, acronym. I'm it, so sorry. It's, CRFB. It's terrible. You know, and you're right. And I, yeah. I apparently, that's, that's what I get for being, uh, not having enough coffee. I get it wrong, too. Um, and, and so you were just, uh, you know, you, you just mentioned that, you know, the America on the world stage. And one of the things that we very rarely talk about in this program, but I've touched on a few times is, I mean, we're the world reserve currency. And if we screw something mm-hmm. up, Good luck getting mm-hmm. back to that status again. I mean, that's just another, you know, that's a that's for another show. That's another 30-minute conversation right there. But, uh, you know, we talk yeah. about taxation, and, uh, and, and it's the holy grail. And I said something, sac- you know, sacrilegious earlier when I said even the Reagan tax cuts uh, were problematic because you can't grow. You wrote an article the other day that I thought was just mm-hmm. excellent that said you can't pay for tax cuts with the economic growth associated with them. Very rarely do they even come close to paying for uh, themselves because you're talking about having to grow an economy four to five dollars for every dollar of tax cut. Usually it has to be commensurate with spending. And even Reagan had spending issues. And I know that a lot of Republicans are screaming right now, but it does happen. You can't just cut and expect uh, cut the taxation, that is, and expect the trickle down growth to explode enough to make it happen. Right. That's right. I mean, there. I think we are engaged right now on all sides in something I call free lunch economics, where you will constantly, and it will, it, this will only grow, you'll hear arguments from our politicians that this is such a good policy, it will either pay for itself, or this is so important, we shouldn't have to pay for it. Right. Uh, neither of those is true. If something is so important, then you should pay for it. And again, you can pay for it with new taxes or cutting spending, completely agnostic to which approach you take. It's just the one of handing the bill to your kids. That's not right. But to your first point, tax cuts do not pay for themselves. Of course, it would be great if we did. Then we could bring our taxes down to zero, right? I don't think anybody credibly can believe that, but there was a lot of myths perpetrated about that during the tax cut debate because paying for the tax cuts, meaning offsetting those costs, means hard choices that politicians don't like to do. Tax cuts do grow the economy. And that's something we really want to focus on right now. We need economic growth, particularly because we have an aging workforce and more and more people are retiring. That's going to bring our growth much lower than it's been before. And we need to do everything we can to grow the economy. You mentioned regulatory reform that the Trump administration has been pursuing. And that's a big contributor to to ways to grow the economy. So that's very helpful. However, tax cuts that create economic growth do not create enough that it generates revenues to make up for the loss. So for every dollar in lost tax cuts, you might collect 20 cents back from the economic growth. Growth is good, but it's not good enough to pay for it. And importantly, the more you offset your tax cuts, the more you pay for them, the higher the growth will be. Because while tax cuts grow the economy, what doesn't grow the economy is debt. Higher levels of debt shrink the economy, so they work at odds against each other. And that's why big tax cuts in the longer run are likely to do much more damage to the economy in terms of growth. Well, again, because they are, they are, there's this lack of a tie to spending and fiscal responsibility. And, and that's a common, it's a common theme in what's going on. 
uh, in the country right now, both at the national level and on many, many state levels. I mean, we have got tremendous deficit spending in something like over 30 of the states where they are spending multiples of, I mean, the amounts that they're they're putting away. I think the last number I saw from California is something like a 60-plus billion dollar annual deficit in their spending, and that's just a microcosm of what we're doing, uh, you know, at the national level. Maya McGinnis is our guest. Maya, hold on the line here just one second. We're going to uh, take a quick break, and when we come back, we're going to uh, we're going to continue this discussion, and we're going to talk about what happens if we continue this path, uh, and what the current discussion is amongst Republicans seems to lock in just that. We'll continue with more with Maya McGinnis for Committee for a Responsible Federal Budget. That is up next right here on your home for Common Sense Radio, The Michael Duke Show. Okay, we're now in the break. Uh, Appreciate you uh, guys sticking with us. Maya, thanks for continuing. Um, We've got a couple questions in the chat room, and I do want to get to them here. Uh, Paul says... Okay, Paul. Paul's Paul's asking the dystopian question. Should we be expecting a serious depression? Should we get prepared to live in a cabin or a farm and ready for a collapse because we're eventually unable to keep up? Um, I mean, sometimes I look at it and think that that might be the case, right? I mean, because it just seems like nobody, I mean, it's like we're on a train, right? And we could see that the bridge is out, you know, ahead in the gulch. But instead of grabbing the brake handle, the guy's like, here, pour some more coal to her. It'll be spectacular. I mean, we're not even paying attention to it. No, it's, it's again, it's political dysfunction. Everybody knows it's an issue. Anybody who's looked at the numbers knows it's a real problem. But our politicians and sort of by extension of them, most of us are bearing our head in the sand and saying, yeah, but borrowing so fun. Isn't it better to spend a lot of money and not have to pay for it? And so it's as though we're testing where that tipping point is, if and when this, this, what it can do to have such a weak fiscal foundation is it can cause a crisis on its own. I think that's less likely in any immediate time, because as you said, we are the safe haven of the country, which of the world, which means people still buy our debt, even when we mess up the economy. Now that can change. And if, and when it does, we'll have given up a huge advantage to our own detriment. But for now, we are able to get away with this longer than almost any other country would. But it also means any other crisis, a banking crisis, a market crisis, a normal recession will be exacerbated much worse because of our debt situation. I don't think the dystopian vision is where we're headed because of our debt. I think it's more the termites in the basement. Something is eating away at our foundation And it will hold back our economy. It will hold back our standard of living. It will contribute to ongoing political and and national tensions. And it's just subtly, it's like a cancer. You can't see it directly, but it is doing real damage to the entire ecosystem of our nation. Uh, the United I guess that's pretty dystopian right there. It, 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 well, it kind of is. I mean, in a way, look, the, the, the fact that the United States is the world reserve currency has been a position that the United States has abused for the last right. 40 years, 35 or 40 years since the, since the you know, some of the, the, uh, 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 the Bainbridge Island, Jekyll, the whole thing. I mean, when you look at it, what it is, we have leveraged that position and kind of used it as a bludgeon with other countries and allowed us really to create this because no other nation, no other nation in the world would do what we are doing because they don't have that world reserve currency status. They are not trading in dollars. They are not buying dollar debt, uh, you know, so you don't see the lira debt or the other, you know, the other, uh, the drachma debt, uh, because they're not a world reserve currency. So really being number one in the world is actually contributing to this behavior more than anything else at this point. Yeah. It's enabling, right? It's sort of letting us get away with it. It's almost like the trust fund kid who inherits this great, these great wealth, but doesn't appreciate it. So we're abusing this kind of gift of being the reserve currency that we that we got that we built up over time and it's just, we're squandering it. The other thing, as, as long as we've gone kind of global in our our economics, but the other thing that really worries me is because this country we save very little little to finance our deficits, the government has to borrow from abroad, and the largest lender to us is China. Other large lenders are some of the big oil oil producing countries. But when you have foreign policy and economic policy becoming increasingly intertwined, 
And we become more dependent on nations where we don't, we aren't in total alignment with our foreign policy or economic goals. That's a vulnerability that concerns me greatly. I don't think we should be borrowing so much that we're structurally dependent on other nations to lend us money. And, and we've seen this before. If China or another country says, ah, I, don't, I don't really think I want to show up to the U.S. Treasury auction this month, that can have profound destabilizing effects on our markets. And that's a dangerous position for us to put ourselves in. That's immediate panic is what that is. That's immediate panic because they're like, oh, my God, what do we do now? I mean, it's it, – It's bad. It's, and I just want to go back to the basics because you can't hammer this home enough. We have to drop our free lunch mentality. We, the voters, have to demand our politicians and say to them, don't add more to the debt. Like, I'm not even asking that they fix the debt quite yet because it, they seem so unable of doing to do anything. But could you ask your politician to promise – not to support votes that would make the debt worse. That's just the first point. So if you want tax cuts, fine, but you have to pay for them with spending cuts or other tax increases. Same with new infrastructure, new entitlements. You have to pay for it. So could we just agree that every politician should promise us not to make the situation worse? Yeah. And we have to stop pretending it's a free lunch. We have, to, we have to stop making up fake economics and instead realize that grown-ups make choices we elect our politicians to lead and serve as fiduciaries of the country, and we have to ask ourselves, you know, hold ourselves to a higher standard than kind of this crazy debt binge that's been going on for years now. All right, hold on one second. Maya McGinnis is our guest. We're continuing our discussions right now. These are discussions of a nationwide nature. We're talking with Maya McGinnis, who is uh, president of the Committee for a Responsible Federal Budget. You can find them at CRFB. Dot org. She writes lots of great stuff, testifies before Congress, and talks about these issues on a daily basis. Uh, if you uh, didn't join us in the chat room, you just missed a great discussion on some of the things there in the, in the middle. Uh, one of the conversation points that has just come up uh, was Maya was talking about, we've got to get a handle on this for the future. And in a, in a big way, this, uh, this raises one of the big questions, Maya, uh, that we were just talking about. I mean, we've got to get a handle on this and get a handle on that spending. And as I said earlier, as the nation goes, so go the states. The states have been following suit on this uh, with, you know, with the debts and the deficits. I mentioned, I mentioned California. But breaking it down even to a farther micro level and trickling it down, as you were, uh, is, is also the American people. We have become just, you know, look at me, let me spend. Uh, we're not saving. We have no savings uh, as a people. Thir three quarters of the United States doesn't have but $5,000 put away in their savings account. I mean, they have no retirement. We are, you know, we spend 105% of our income every year. I mean, this is a systemic, institutionalized problem in the United States. I don't know why we're surprised that our politicians are going this way. That's right. I mean, the culture of savings is something of the past. With the onset of credit cards and bigger home mortgages and a sense that you don't need to pay cash for anything, we don't have what, what our parents and grandparents had, which was the notion you needed to save up to buy big ticket items, that saving was a part of the culture and that you're always saving for a rainy day or for the future. Right. And so... And we've had more and more financial financial products that allow us not to save, which are really important in many ways to smooth out risk and help us at different times. The entire culture of savings has been lost. And that concerns me because it's part of what keeps your economy growing. You can consume, which grows your economy in the immediate moment, or you can save and use that for investment or you know, buy stocks or leave it at the bank where someone borrows it and invests. And that grows your economy over the longer term. And it's kind of those old things your grandmother would tell you. But, you know, this, the, the saving, if you save a little every day, that's what builds up. It's the same for our economy. And we just don't have that approach to money and saving and deferred gratification. Uh, and I don't want to sound like my grandmother, but, you know, a little bringing some of that back into our culture would make us a healthier economy. Well, our savings rate is frighteningly low. Right. And, and, and again, when it comes time to invest, when it comes time to utilize that capital in an, in an intelligent way, you know, saved capital is a lot cheaper to use than borrowed capital. 
And so it makes things more attractive. And, and in the long run, it actually engenders less risk uh, for, you know, for, for people to do. But people have forgotten that. They just, I mean, that again, that's the buy it now, instant gratification mentality that we've developed in this country. Uh, you know, kind of that microwave meal mentality is, is really, you know, leading to this detrimental effect in, in the overall system. Yeah, I, I, I completely agree with you. Um, and I think that it is it is a real problem when there is no notion that you have to make choices. And so the ability to borrow for everything also contributes to that. So sometimes there's been a, a theory that is starving the beast, meaning you create a budget deficit and that will put pressure on Congress to start controlling spending. Wait, it doesn't happen at all. I'm just the reverse say, happens. Once, <laughs> how's that working out yeah, for you? We've never seen it work. It's like a nice theory. Someone invented it in a bar, but on a napkin, but it doesn't work at all. Once you introduce deficit financing into the picture, everything actually starts to feel free. And you're going to see this, mark my words, you're going to see this in the coming months, probably with infrastructure bills, but maybe something else where people are saying, we need more infrastructure. Um, parents at full point, I completely agree. We need better infrastructure in this country. It's, it's crumbling, it's a mess, and it's hurting us in the long run. But they're going to say, we don't need to pay for it. Either we don't because we didn't pay for the tax cuts, or it will pay for itself, or it's too important to pay for all those justifications. But the truth is that by choosing the things you want to spend money on, you'll make much better choices. But once you have deficit financing available, you don't even evaluate whether something's worth doing. You might think it's not worth doing. But if we don't have a cost or a price tag on it and it's free, everybody's going to say, sure, sign me up. So without paying for something, you take away the decision of, is this actually worth it? We, we are going to start publishing something called, is it worth it? Where every new spending idea Congress says, I'm going to break down those costs on a per person or a per family basis. So you can see, is this new bridge worth every family paying $17 a month? You know, it may be, it may not be, but we should have those numbers as something that we think about. And again, it's kind of reducto ridiculous where you, you bring it down to the lowest level, but at the same time, it shows the true cost. And I think, I think that is important. Now, one of the latest articles you've written, of course, is with this Republican push to take the tax cuts, which, as you said, on their face sound great, except for you have to have the commensurate spending reduction to really make them work in the long run. And instead of trying to fix the problems, and we're talking about Thomas Massey the other day talked about not a trillion dollar a year deficit, but potentially for the first couple, three years, up to a two trillion dollar a year deficit of spending mm. remains on track, uh, which is just astronomical. Uh, but now they're talking about making these tax cuts permanent, which uh, I mean, I don't even want to know how fast that takes us off the rails. Well, I'll, I'll tell you, even though you don't want to know, but <laughs> over the next two decades, that'll add another $5 trillion to the national debt. $5 trillion. I would be worried if we were talking about adding $50 billion, and we're talking about $5 trillion. And that's another problem. The numbers are so jaw-dropping that they lose all meaning. And right. so if you're saying five, $5 trillion, well, what's another trillion? I mean, everybody just loads up everything. And that's what's happened. The tax cuts happen without spending cuts. Then we had spending increases without pay-fors, and there'll be more and more justifications to do that. There is There are no breaks in Congress right now. And again, that's why I go back to we need some kind of commitment from our members of Congress. Just the first one, the easy one, promise not to vote for something that makes the debt worse. Right. That's not even going to get us to a good enough place, but it's broken. So stop breaking it more. And it just, you know, these these are the grown-ups in the room. That's what we elected them to take care of the country and kind of spending all the fruits of the nation's labor in in the short term and leaving us with a real debt dilemma that our kids won't be able to fix and won't be able to recover from. I think we'll go down in history as one of the most irresponsible things that, that a nation could have done. And that, I don't want that to be the course for this country. We, we can do so much better. And let's talk about the ramifications if we don't. And again, I don't want to be a downer Debbie here, but if nobody else, if nobody else, as you said, will be the adult in the room and talk about. It. And first of all, to say to say that we elected these jokers to be the adults in the room, I think we a lot of people elected these folks to bring home the bacon. 
bring us home that federal mm-hmm. sugar, you know, to bring it home. And mm-hmm. make, so I, I think that maybe we're at some point we're at cross purposes as a nation on a citizen by citizen basis. But let's talk for just a minute about the ramifications. You mentioned it earlier um, and we've discussed it on this program. Social Security. Uh, I just said that, you know, 74 percent of Americans have no retirement plan. They are re- they're going to be supposedly relying on Social Security. Well, that's not going to happen. Social Security is going to be, I mean, it'll still be there, but the the payment would be so far reduced, uh, and this is going to start in just a few years, right? Yeah, we actually have a Social Security ca- uh, calculator on our website, so people can go there and just plug in the year that they were born and see when their benefits will be cut and by how much. And this, again, is a just kick the can, bury your head in the sand. Everybody knows that Social Security is headed towards insolvency, not where I'll be able to pay any benefits, but where there'll be across the board cut in benefits for everybody all of a sudden when the trust funds run out of money. And we also know how to fix it. There's sort of five basic things we can do. We can talk about raising the retirement age, changing the formula for how our benefits work, means testing, raising the revenues that go into the program. It's not that hard to fix. We actually have another simulator on our website where people can go through and fix the entire program, and we run it with members of Congress. It is purely and simply, well, it's two things. Members of Congress don't want to do something hard, but I think even more dangerous is that a lot of politicians prefer to leave problems unfixed and run on scaring people. I mean, Social Security is one of the most contentious issues you'll ever hear during election time, with everybody accusing each other of ruining it and robbing your grandmother and taking money that you've earned, despite the fact that because people live so much longer, most people get out many, many times more than what they put into Social Security. That's how it has been in the past. But we are unable to sit down and just go through kind of the nuts and bolts of what's the best way to fix the system. And every year that we wait, it becomes significantly more expensive. Right. Maya McGinnis is our guest. Maya, we're down to the last 90 seconds here. So let me ask you this last question here. Larry asks, so how, explain how we get both sides to realize this reality and work towards f- fixing this issue? What What is your choice? Give me two or three bullet points before we run out of time here. So it has to be an issue in elections. It has, there has to be a mandate for it. So everybody, when they're talking to their politicians, has to say, how would you pay for it? Trillion dollar deficits, what would you do to get rid of them? Don't take the, the, the sort of, oh, I'd have a balanced budget amendment without filling in the details. If you have a balanced budget amendment, tell me what you would do to balance the budget. Number two, ask your member of Congress to commit not to make the situation worse, not to support legislation that will add to the national debt. And number three, we're going to build a group. Uh, we're going to build a fiscal responsibility group of members in the House and Senate and we need people to sign up and be a part of that and show their constituents it's something they care about. And number four, we have to want it. Because if you always elect the person who will give you tax cuts or spending increases instead of the person who will make the, the healthy longer term choices and figure out how to pay for those things and fix the debt that we're on, then we will be responsible for the damage that we're doing to our economy. You know, you're you're asking people to be responsible adults. That might be the most difficult part of the whole thing. Maya McGinnis. We can do it. We can do it. (laughs) We can. Thanks for coming on and joining us. Hold on, Maya. CRFB.org is that uh, website address. Back with more. The Michael Duke Show. It is your home for common sense, liberty-based, free-thinking radio. Hour two of today's big radio broadcast. And today is the pencil and slide rule edition of the show. I mean, we are doing deep dives we were just talking with Maya McGinnis, who is the president uh, of the Committee for uh, Responsible Federal Gov- uh, Budgets, and uh, the sister, kind of the sister organization or sibling organization of that here in the state of Alaska, is Alaskans for a Sustainable Budget. Now, the director of that organization's name is Brad Keithley. He's a frequent guest here on the program, usually on Tuesdays. But today we thought we'd mix it up and bring him on. Today he joins us uh, right now to discuss things. Good morning, sir. How are you? Michael, I'm doing great. How are you today? You know, there's no complaining. No complaining at all. Um, I mean, except for, of course, I had no sleep. The power was out. Uh, you know, my nose itches. I'll complain anything. It doesn't matter. Um, let's uh, let's talk about, first of all, your reaction before we get into the weekly top three your reaction to our discussions with Maya here just a moment ago, I know you were listening. 
Well, let's let's roll. Let's let, let's sort of set aside the weekly top three, or at least the top one, sort of the end, and sort of let's sort of roll right into the Alaska version of what was Maya, what Maya was talking about. And it was a you had a great conversation with her. If I could have if I could have sketched out the perfect conversation, uh, that would have been it. But but what you're seeing at the at the federal level, what she talked about as the as the debt issue that we've become addicted to debt. And that's driving all of these decisions we make and that we think we have free goods because we're just paying for it with debt and rolling it to, to future generations. We have the exact same thing uh, going on in Alaska with one with one with one chain with one difference. And that is instead of debt, we're just running through a bunch of fiscal reserves that we've set up uh, uh, over the, over the years up until this this latest crisis. And we're using that as sort of our debt. We're using that as sort of the way to continue having free goods uh, in this state. We started out by going through the, the statutory budget reserve, about $5 billion there. Uh, and then we, we, we shifted over and started use, using the constitutional budget reserve, which, by the way, we have to pay back, and we'll talk about that uh, in, in a few minutes. Uh, but there's about $12 billion there. Uh, that we've run through, and now, now the latest is to use the PFD uh, as as sort of the next reserve, and start cutting the PFD and diverting funds uh, from the PFD uh, over to over to government, uh, and using that to continue, you know, let the, continue letting the good good times roll, and not facing up to the spending issues uh, that that we have here in the state. So. Everything Maya said at the is going on at the federal level that's driving us into the ditch uh, at the federal level, shifting costs to our kids, putting burdens on them, kids and grandkids putting burdens on them that we can't deal with, uh, uh, driving uh, 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 the, the, the nation more and more toward having to have higher taxes to pay for what we're doing. Everything that we're doing there. Uh, it has a corollary uh, in Alaska, and we're just going down. We're going down the same road, even to the point, you know, she was talking about, you know, it, or you were talking about, and then she was talking about economic growth being, you know, sort of, well, we'll, we'll pay it, we'll, we'll, we'll get out of this by having economic growth, and economic growth will pay uh, for all of this, uh, this debt we're, we're running up by, you know, generating new revenues and new tax revenues, and that'll, that'll pay for itself. We got the same thing going on here. Instead of economic growth here, we talk about oil price recovery and production increases. That's going to save us. We can continue having the good times go grow or continue to have the good times run uh, uh, because we're you know down the road we're going to have oil price recovery and we're going to have production increases, and so that will 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 bail us out at the end. That's that's simply the state equivalent, the state myth equivalent of economic growth. Uh, at the federal level that that is going to is going to somehow save us uh, at the federal level. So you can take what Maya said, uh change the words a little bit uh and change the change the pots of money it's coming from a little bit. Uh but it it's it's the same thing that's going on in the state right now. You know, and this is again as I was saying earlier, this is very much a case of monkey see monkey do. <laughs> Uh, you know, we're we're getting at the only problem with the state of Alaska is that we don't have the power to print the money and to levy a larger taxation scheme and to and to monkey with the markets and do some of these other things. Otherwise, I'm sure we'd probably be in an even worse situation than we are right now, because, again, there seems and, and the commonality here, again, seems to be that there is no political will to make the hard decisions that would entail actually reducing spending and stopping the gravy train ride for whatever special interest you're, whether it's the welfare recipients or or aid assistance from the government on the one hand on the more progressive side or the corporate payouts and cronyism on the right side, there is just no, you know, political will to make any of those things happen. Because there's no cost. There's no there's no cost that citizens see. Uh, in, uh, uh, in 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 those a in those activities, I mean, Maya at the, at the federal level was, is talking about debt that that to pay all, to make those payments, uh, all we're simply doing is running up debt, shoving it to uh, the next generation, uh, and there's no cost to current citizens. I mean, we get to the Congress is giving out tax cuts at the time the deficit is growing. 
um, and and saying, ah, oh, not only does it not, it's not going to cost you as much as it did. It's not going to cost you as much as it did yesterday to keep this stuff going. We can give you tax cuts, uh, and 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 it'll cost less. And you can we can just keep having more and more of these of these goods. I mean, the, the greatest disconnect uh, over the last decade uh, was what Congress did in December, and then what they did in January. In December, they gave us tax cuts. And said, "Okay, we're we're gonna we're gonna charge you less uh, for the cost of government, uh, and and we're gonna you know we're gonna we're gonna resolve to to bring down the co- uh, bring down uh, 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 w- what we charge you for it, and 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 the implication was we'll bring down the cost of government, and then in in January, February, and March, they passed a huge spending increase, um, and said, well." You know, we're going to give you more of these goodies. We're going to give you more of these free goods. We're going to give you more national defense. We're going to give you more uh, discretionary spending or uh, uh, non-national defense discretionary spending. Uh, and, and at the same time, the mandatory spending, Social Security and, and Medicare, keeps going up right alongside that. So, I mean, there's just a huge disconnect, and, and the way they finance that is through debt. Well, frankly, Alaska has done much of the same thing. Uh, Legislative Finance Division just came out with their analysis, their budget analysis of what really happened uh, in the in in this last session, the budget, the FY 2019 budget that was passed. It went from 4.5 billion dollars, 4.4 billion dollars uh, in FY 2018 to 4.8 billion dollars uh, unrestricted general fund spending. It increased at a time when we at, at a time when everybody said, "Oh, we're going to keep cutting." We just we we increase the goodies uh, uh, for for Alaskans, and how do, how are we paying for that? We're paying it by draining these fiscal reserves, uh, by having already drained the SBR, uh, just about finished draining the CBR. We got about 1.8 billion dollars left in it, uh, out of out of about 12 to 13 billion dollars when we started, uh, and and now by cutting the PFD, it's just they they, they keep thinking. Uh, that the answer to this is 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 just debt, more debt at the federal level, and more draining of fiscal reserves at the state level, and keep giving us uh, and keep giving the citizens more goodies. There's going to be, a, just as Maya was describing at the federal level, there's going to be there's going to be a huge reckoning at some point, and in Alaska there's going to be a huge reckoning as well. We can't keep this uh, uh, this this gravy train, this free gravy train, financed off the backs of our kids. By draining fiscal reserves, we can't keep it going, and at some point, it's gonna it's gonna come back to bite us. The politicians today hope it's not on their watch. Hope right. that they get through their terms, they get they get their retirement before it before it is. Right, right. Uh, but they just keep they just keep giving it. Brad Keithley is our guest uh, from Alaska's for Sustainable Budget. Brad, uh, I mean that's one example of kind of the monkey see monkey do. But I mean, also we're already talking about borrowing more. I mean the the the. Uh, the governor has discussed whether or not we should be bonding to pay off the PERS and TERS debt. I know Berkowitz has talked about bonding capital projects. Uh, I mean, you know, and again, borrowing it because, again, there's no cost to us if we just borrow it and kick it down the road. Of course, we know that then the attitude and the appetite to actually pay back these things then is decreased in the long run as well. I mean, this is just it's a recipe for disaster. And, and Michael Dunleavy is not is not free of this. I mean, when you look at Dunleavy's budget, um, the the new budget, not the old Mike Dunleavy, but the new Mike Dunleavy, the one that now talks about four point a four point three operating budget, uh, he's doing the same thing. He, he's he's paying it in, to some degree by continuing to draw down the CBR, uh, the the constitutional budget reserve, the, the the remaining amounts that are in there, diverting. Income that otherwise is 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 directed to the CBR, directing that directing that to continue to support higher uh, budget levels than we can afford, uh, and just like just like you know the Republicans at the at the national level, he's talking about we're going to work our way out of this through increased oil production and oil prices. Well, maybe that occurs, maybe that doesn't occur, but that's not something that you bet budgets on. Uh, uh, you, you take a, you take, you need to take a hard look, just like you do at the federal level about these claims of economic growth, and they're going to, you know, they're going to pay for uh, these tax cuts uh, by themselves through through economic growth. You need to take a hard look at that, and and it's never happened. You need to take a hard look at relying on the same thing. So, yes, uh, certainly, 
Uh, Governor Walker is talking about continuing this free ride through issuing debt to, to, to you know, cover what we owe on the uh, on the uh, uh, pensions uh, front. Um, uh, Begich is talking about, you know, bonding. He wants to do zero. He wants to have zero appropriations for capital budgets and do the capital budgets almost entirely on debt. Um, uh, so that would give you the ability to just have a huge capital budget. Say it's all going to be issue, all going to be funded through debt, uh, and and you know we'll let our children and our grandchildren pay for it as opposed to stepping up for it for ourselves. But even Dunleavy is not immune from this with this talk about diverting supporting budgets by diverting more money from the CBR uh, and by you know relying on uh, future uh, economic growth, oil price and production recovery to uh, to to pay for these continued budgets. So somebody's got to be the adult in the room. Dunley, the old Mike Dunleavy was. Uh, hopefully, he sort of comes back at some point during the campaign, or comes back once he's governor. Uh, he's certainly better than the other two on this issue, uh, but 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 even he is succumbing to uh, you know D.C. fever, uh, Potomac River fever of saying, oh, you know, we don't have to make the hard choices. We can put them off. Uh, we're going to be saved by uh, by by somebody coming out of the out of the stratosphere. Uh, and, uh, and and giving us more money. Yeah, I think we, we, we used to call that the Jack Daniels fever. I don't know about Potomac fever. I think somebody's liquored up and they're just running wild and rampant. Um, uh, and I think maybe I just need to – I think I, I threatened this the last time we talked. I'm going to play matchmaker and get you and Dunn leaving the room together and you could <laughs> beat him about the head and shoulders with a budget book and say, well, you know, what what are you thinking? Where's the old Mike Dunleavy? Uh, and I, I will, I will make that happen, Brad. I mean, we've got to get, we've got to get these numbers in front of him because, like you said, the old Mike Dunleavy understood this, it seemed, and now I think uh, it, it's question of who is he surrounding himself with that he's getting this new number and that this is the answer. Is it more of the kind of chamber of commerce crowd who is in his ear saying we can't have all this government cuts because it'll wreck us? Or, I mean, what are your thoughts on that here in the next sixty seconds? Well, I, I will say that Mike, that in the past week, and I, and I attribute this to, to, to some degree to you, um, Dunleavy's reached out and asked for, uh, you know, what I'm basing my numbers on, and I'm, I'm sending a, sending off a package to him uh, today to, to have that conversation. So that conversation is going on, and and he didn't repeat 4.3 yesterday at the at the uh, Anchorage uh, Chamber of Commerce meeting, at least in the reports I saw. So that maybe that's maybe that's a sign of some progress. But but you ca- but you can't you can't continue uh, on uh, talking about budgets that are financed off of the back of the CBR. This is the point at which we need to turn around and we need to start paying the CBR back. Maybe we can talk about that in the second segment. You can't keep drawing on the CBR and, and keep the, the good times rolling by, by uh, drawing on the CBR anymore. Yeah, Brad Keithley is our guest. Uh, Harold says, tax cuts. Our taxes went up, and I think that's even the worst of the both worlds. We didn't even get a tax cut with all that stuff. We instead got, a again, a tax increase and um, you know more spending. I mean, it's, it, is, it is the definition, as I said earlier, of insanity. We got more coming up. Don't go anywhere. Brad Keithley is our guest. We're discussing the state of Alaska and more. I mean, really, Brad, that is the, I mean, that is the, you want to talk about a total poo parade. Uh, the fact that they didn't give us tax cuts and they've increased the spending. Instead, they have increased right. the taxes on us in the most detrimental way possible and increased the spending by about half a billion dollars overall is just, it's insane. Yeah, but here's here's the deal on that, Michael. The top twenty percent doesn't realize that, right? That the, the tax that's gotten imposed on Alaskans is through the PFD cut, which has the 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 biggest impact on middle income and lower income Alaskans. It has a minute I mean it costs less than a Starbucks a day, uh impact on on the top twenty percent. And and uh, and some of them believe it's free money in the first place. I mean they go down that road. So yeah, so I can't buy, you know, I can't buy a new painting, or I can't, you know, stay a day longer on my trip to to Hawaii, or I can't. I mean, that that's sort of how they that's sort of how they relate to it. They don't view it uh, as as a tax by 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 doing this stuff through PFD cuts and shoving it to the middle and the lower income lower income Alaskans. The the top twenty percent the 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 the, the, the 
the the good times are continuing for them, right? They get to they get to continue to have government spending, high government spending, which you know a, a segment of the top twenty percent depends on, um, and, and benefits from, but they don't have to pay for it. So it's we're not seeing they're not seeing the cost uh, side of of government. We've got to find a way. I believe it's a flat tax. Other believe, others believe it's other ways. But we've got to find a way where all Alaskans are seeing the costs of and the consequences of, of, what, we're, of what we're doing uh, through these spending programs at, at the state government level. And, I, you know, it's not going to happen with Walker. He's going to continue pushing it off on the PFD cuts. Um, it's not going to. It's, it's not going to happen. I don't think with Begich because Begich believes in a progressive income tax, and that's just that just creates the problem in reverse. It just loads it all on the top twenty percent and lets the middle income and the lower income sort of off the hook. So then, then they're the ones pushing for increased government because they don't see the cost. Um, and and Dunleavy Dunleavy is sort of the the hope in this, um, but he's got to get his budget numbers right, or else or else we crash and burn going down. Uh, going down the, that road, so it's um, uh, it, it, it's a we we've walked ourselves uh, into a difficult situation. Obligatory disclaimer: Neither Michael Dukes nor Brad Keithley advocate for a income tax, a sales tax, or a flat tax, except for the fact that we have to try and control the conversation, right? I mean, that's I mean, I have to put that kind of obligatory warning uh, because we're not in favor of a new tax. But if you are going to talk about a tax, which seems to be the way that they continually frame this conversation, which means, of course, that they can't control their spending then the flat tax makes the most sense. But, I mean, that's part of the problem, is that they have framed this as an argument of do we have a revenue problem or do we have a spending problem? Uh, 60 seconds here, Brad. Uh, uh, we, have a, we have a spending problem. Oh, absolutely we have a spending problem. But, but it, it creates a revenue problem. If we can't get the spending under control, and even the Alaska Senate, who said, you know, we're going to draw the line in the sand, we're going to protect Alaskans, even they – uh, uh, continue to spend. Uh, if we have, if we can't control the spending problem, then we do have a revenue problem, and and we have to pay for we have to pay for that spending somehow. And we've run through all the reserves uh, that we have to do it. So I, it has to come from somewhere, and it has. And if we're going to do it as we've done it with PFD cuts, we need to do it in a way that actually curbs spending, that makes all Alaskans see the cost, and not let some income class uh, off from paying from paying a portion of the cost. All right, Brad Keithley is our guest, Alaskans for Sustainable. Welcome back to your home for common sense, liberty-based, free-thinking radio, The Michael Duke Show. Uh, Brad Keithley from Alaskans for a Sustainable Budgets is our uh, guest for today, normally on Tuesdays, but uh, we got him in here today, which was good because we just followed up with Maya McGinnis from Citizens for Responsible Federal Budgets. Which I mean, it can, these things have been kind of hand in glove, and we've had a good opportunity to uh, uh, to kind of go over this stuff. Uh, Brad, we kind of did uh, we kind of did a big long top one of the top three, your big weekly top three. Uh, do you want to kind of try and take a crack at number two right now? Let's uh, let's talk for a second about the CBR. I talked about that in the first segment, and I and and that I think. Uh, as we talk, as I've talked about Dunleavy's budget, the CBR is becoming uh, an issue. So the CBR, Constitutional Budget Reserve, is intended was intended by the 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 the, the founders of that particular provision in the Constitution to sort of be a reserve, right? To be there to draw from uh, during periods of, of of revenue problems, and to be filled back up. Uh, when those revenue problems uh, uh, are subsiding and we're beginning to to generate additional revenue, uh, as in the way Scott Goldsmith talks about it, revenue above the long-term sustainable uh, uh, budget level, and and the CBR needs to be it needs to be done both ways. I mean, it needs to be used when we have when we have a low price cycle, low oil price, low production cycle, and it needs to be filled back up for future jet for the benefit of future generations. Uh, when uh, uh, when we start having higher oil prices, we start having higher production. If we don't do that, the, if we don't fill it back up, the next time we hit uh, a low oil price, low oil production cycle, and we will, we know that, oil prices go up, oil prices go down, right. oil prices go back up, they go back down. Uh, and we know that. 
if we don't fill the CBR uh, back up, then we do have a serious crisis uh, when we hit the next the next low cycle. I mean, we've we've made it. If you read the papers and they talk about you know the fact we've been in a recession, but it's been a mild recession. We've sort of made our way through it. Uh, the reason we've made our way through it is because we we spent about uh, 12, 20 billion well twenty billion dollars by the time you count it all up uh, in drawing reserves from the CBR uh, and the SBR the, the statutory budget reserve to bolster government spending uh, into the economy without taxing uh, bolster government spending uh, through this low price cycle. If that, given given that the SBR is gone. The CBR is down to less than $2 billion, uh, and we're already into PFD cuts. If we don't fill the CBR back up the next time we hit that cycle, we don't have that cushion to, to fall back on. Now that oil prices are, tr are trending back up to around $80, which when viewed uh, from a long-term perspective is, is probably uh, as good as it's going to get for a while, uh, now that production is on its way back up, we need to be – Filling, refilling uh, the constitutional budget reserve, the, 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 the constitutional provision that, that under, under, underlies the constitutional budget reserve says that it will be filled back up. So now that we're, in, we're coming back into a higher revenue cycle, we need to start refilling the CBR. We don't need to do it all at once. It's about $12 billion that we owe it. We don't need to do it all at once, but we need to have a plan uh, for how we're going to, to fill it back up. One of the problems I have with Dunleavy's new budget proposal is it doesn't account for that. It doesn't take into account using any of the revenues uh, that we that were that we're beginning to generate again uh, to to refill the CBR. It, neither does uh, Walkers, and neither does Begich's, by the way. But but you know Dunleavy's sort of our hope here, right? So we, we I sort of focus on him more than the others. It's not it's not taking a portion of that and starting to fill uh, the CBR back up. And it's going to take a while to fill the CBR up. Even, even, you know, at tw at a twelve billion dollar hole that we borrowed from it, um, if you even if you say we're going to fill it back up over ten years, which is a fairly long long time, it sort of expects that we're going to be able to put off the next downdraft in the oil cycle and production cycle for that long a period of time. So we have it there when we hit it. Even if you say that we're going to take ten years to fill it back up, that's a billion two a year. Uh, uh, in order to, to to contribute to it to get it back to the twelve billion dollar uh, level, so it, it is the CBR is an important function uh, of of the way Alaska's fiscal structure is built up. In some ways, it sort of served the same way as the Social Security Trust Fund has to the federal government. I mean, it's been a it's been a source of funds to the federal government and allowed the federal government really not to have to go out in the open market uh, and get additional debt. Uh, uh, at the federal level, well, the CBR sort of worked the same way, but just like the Social Security Trust Fund, the federal government needs to fill that back up as people start drawing down on their Social Security benefits. At, at a state level, we need to fill the CBR back up, hugely important part of the way the Alaska fiscal situation works, and a hugely important thing that we need to do count, take into account as we as we build these budgets uh, going forward. And 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 we're, we're not talking about it enough, just like we're not talking about, you know, the need to to to, to deal with our, our federal issues enough. Uh, we're not talking about filling the CBR back up. That drives that drives a need, another need, another reason to keep spending down to to take be able to take a portion of these revenues uh, and fill the CBR back up. Brad Keithley is our guest, Alaskans for a Sustainable Budget. Brad Harold in the chat room says, you can't talk about rebuilding the CBR without talking about fixing the oil tax rate as well. Um, I don't know that those two things are inextricably linked, but I think there is some indicators that, I mean, we do need to at least uh, come to grips with this in the long run. There needs to be a stable oil taxation scheme, but it also needs to be, I think, a little bit more favorable to Alaska than it is right now. I don't know that there's a whole lot of room in there, but a point or two that, you know, where we could uh, we could still do it so that we're not being treated, uh, I think, as a land bank in a lot of ways. I think that there are other places that are less geopolitically stable than Alaska that are feeling this, and I think this is part of that. Yeah, so so the, 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 the key touchstone of any oil uh, tax policy 
is we don't want to kill the good golden goose. We, we want to keep taxes at a level where they generate revenue for Alaska, the maximum revenue we can generate for Alaska without serving as a disincentive uh, to additional uh, investment in Alaska. So you've got to sort of figure out where Alaska's place is in the overall global oil scheme. Um, uh, Alaska has higher costs than, than, than elsewhere. And so you sort of got to take that into account, layering on a tax that might make sense in, in North Dakota, for example, on top of Alaska's uh, higher costs than North Dakota could could you know be the tipping point and result in dis- uh, disinvestment in Alaska projects at a time when we should be attracting additional investment when the industry overall is growing in terms of investment and Alaska needs to be taking uh, its proportionate share of that. So that's sort of the touchstone that that you want a tax scheme that uh, that that uh, uh, doesn't disincentive. Uh, disincentivize uh, additional investment in the state. We, we we evaluated that. I'm I am I was part of the process. I am I am fully uh, confident that that was fully evaluated when we did SB 21. And at the time that we did SB 21, I th- SB 21 was the right thing to do. You could see under Aces the disinvestment that was going on in Alaska. You could see the growing investment that was going on in the rest of the world in Alaska's percentage share of that of that growing investment was falling uh, rapidly under ACES. It was taking too much, uh, uh, creating too much of a cost burden uh, to, to, to attract investment to Alaska. So SB 21, I think, fixed that. There are ways, there are things about SB 21 that, that are worthy of attention. One of them, uh, which was the way we treated new oil, uh, got addressed in the last legislature. We shortened up the period on, on sort of the no tax uh, uh, approach we had to to new oil, so we fixed a few things as we've gone along. It prob- we probably can go back in. We probably should go back in and look at the rates now that we've had a reduction in federal corporate inc- corporate income tax rates. Uh, Governor Hammond's vision uh, at the time uh, that he was talking about oil taxes was a third to the a state, a third to the to the federal government, and a third to uh, 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 to the producers. The federal government has stepped down their share uh, through the reduction in the corporate income tax rates. Um, and so the, there's a question about whether or not the, the ratio, the relationship between the state uh, and, the, and the producers is right in, in, in light of the fact that, uh, that the federal government stepped back. That's probably something worth looking at. But fundamentally, we need to keep in mind this is not about how much can we grab for Alaska. It is What's what's the right uh, uh, level uh, for Alaska to take, uh, but to continue to have incentives for uh, investment up here, and that's that's an issue that, uh, that that requires a lot of work and a lot of analysis. Uh, one that we can undertake again is being undertaken again, uh, but uh, but but we need to keep in mind we Aces, Aces is a is a uh, is a lesson to all of us. We can grab too much. It will do us harm if we do that. Uh, let's not do that to ourselves again. Brad Keithley is our guest, Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. Uh, Brad, I'm going to do something that I don't normally do. I'm going to actually ask you to stick with us for a few minutes on the other side of the break. We're going to I'm going to ask you one more question before we go to break, but I was going to ask you to stick with us for maybe five more minutes on the other side of the break, and then we'll let you go, and I can wrap up the rest of the show. But uh, I think it's important. Now, you did a little machinations around from what your original top three were um, because of Maya and some of the things that she talked about. But I do want to get into what was originally your second point of the week, which was what's happening with the PFD and what do we need to do to keep it long term. So set that on the back burner for just a second before we go. Okay. Um, but I want to talk for just a second here about the sustainability of the CFR, the ERA, the uh, uh, the you know the S the uh, the statutory reserve fund. I'm not sorry, not the CFR, but the the you know the uh, constitutional budget reserve, the CBR. The, this and the statutory budget reserve, you know, wh- where do we need to be on all these things to make it work in the long term? Uh, because again, you've talked about why they're important: the fact that they are they stabilize because we are a revenue based economy, because we have such a problem with the volatility of that re- of that revenue source. Where do they need to be for the long term? Wrap us up on this here in the next ninety seconds or so, two minutes. Yep, absolutely. So we need to refill the CBR. The CBR was $12 billion 
uh, roughly 12 billion. We borrowed roughly 12 billion dollars from it. It's roughly it was roughly 14 billion dollars. We need to we need to refill the CBR. We need to give the next generation that same uh, financial cushion that we've used ourselves. And people who say, well, we don't need to refill it up all the way. You know, maybe just 10 billion dollars, maybe 8 billion dollars. Well. Baloney. We just went through twelve. We just went through twelve billion dollars of it. I mean, we've demonstrated that you need that full cushion uh, in order to survive. So we need to fill it back up, uh, so it's there uh, for future generations when they go through the same thing uh, that we've just gone on. And we need to do it. We we can't do it over the next thirty years because we're going to be in these price cycles. Uh, these price cycles have about ten years uh, that they that they go up and down. So we're going to be in in another one of these within a period of time. So I think. The right thing to think about is filling it back up over a 10-year period. We're $12 billion in the hole. About a billion to a year um, is, is what it's going to take to get it filled back up. People say that's a lot. Boy, you know, that's that's just taking a lot out of our revenue stream. Well, yes, but we've, we've used up a lot of it. We've used that $12 billion up uh, in about five years' time. So it it, it, yeah, it, it, it is a lot. It is going to take a lot out of our revenue stream, but we have an obligation uh, from a from from a financial uh, a responsibility standpoint to to have that reserve sitting there so that future generations have the same benefit or the same cushion uh, that we have. A billion to a year, I think, is the right number. We can quibble about that. We can say maybe it's a billion some years, a billion four other years when revenues get higher. That's fine. Let's qu- we can quibble about that, but we need to start making. Uh, these contributions, significant contributions back to the CBR with the goal in, in 10 years of having it built back up to, 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 to what it should be. Brad Keithley is our guest, Alaskans for Sustainable Budget. Uh, all right, Brad, I appreciate you sticking with us. We'll probably take you till just about uh, 10 minutes before the hour, uh, maybe maybe eight minutes before the hour. Give me a chance to wrap up there at the end of the show. Uh, yep. But I definitely wanted to get back to this uh, – to the second point, again, we're talking about, you know, what happens to the budget. Uh, you know, what do we have to do to keep the PFD long term? And I think we covered a little bit of it, but I'd like to specifically get in on it. Uh, because this is yep. an issue I think that most Alaskans are, are concerned about, and we need some concise, you know, conciseness on that. So uh, we'll get into that. Great. I, it's, a, it, it's an issue that we need to be talking about during this campaign. Just like Maya said, with, with respect to federal issues, the time that politicians are the most vulnerable, the time that politicians will listen to you uh, the most is during an election cycle. Uh, the time they'll be most open with you is during an election cycle. The time they'll be the most arrogant <laughs> is, is once they're elected back in office. They think they, they, you know, they, they've won the personal popularity contest and they think they could do no wrong. So, right. Uh, it's, it's like a issue, sliding it's issue we need to. It's like a sliding scale, you know, they're, they're open, open, open election day, day after election, they're closed. And then it slides slowly back to open, you know, before they get to the next election day kind of thing, you know, and it's like, oh man, nobody, nobody should have to deal with that. Yeah, exactly right. I, and, and, and it's an issue that, uh, frankly, it's one of the reasons that I, that I'm, that I'm happy to see Ron Gillum (laughs) go to, go to a write-in campaign. It's an issue that, that needs to be talked about in all of these districts, uh, it, it, now that we're through, it, it shouldn't stop. Now that we're through the primary, it should continue uh, during during the general election cycle. And and those who you know who go down to Juneau and represent us need to be exposed to those issues and need to have to have to talk about those issues. So uh, this is the time to do it. And and talking about the CBR, uh, believe me, that's not an issue they're going to want to talk about once they get back to Juneau. They're just going to want just like at the federal, just like Maya at the federal government level. They want to continue to, to roll on in debt. Those at the state level just want to say, well, that CBR thing, we'll get to that. We'll get to that someplace. Uh, but in the meantime, we got all these revenues. Let's let's spend them. Let's have a capital budget. Let's have a party. Uh, you know, happy days are here again. And and that's just exactly the wrong thing to be doing as we come out of this uh, out of this low price cycle. So it's something it's something we have to talk about during the campaign because they will not listen to it once uh, once they're once they're elected. Three minutes here, Brad, uh, but you brought it up, so I'm going to go with it. Uh, this whole thing with uh, District O and, and uh, Machiki and Ron Gillum. Uh, now, Machiki had a real big mea culpa that he put out on Facebook, and I'm hearing rumblings that he's going to be trying to make all these stances on different things from crime and the PFD and everything else. 
Um, but I mean, I, I don't know. What are your What are your thoughts on this write-in campaign? I mean, first of all, how big of a chance do you think Gillum has? And if he doesn't, even if it's a you know, I mean, what what are your thoughts on it? I guess overall, um, I I well, like Ron Gillum. I, I like Ron Gillum, and I would like to see him in there. But what are your thoughts on it uh, overall? Well, let's take the second thing first. Does he have a chance? The question is going to be: Can he get some money behind the effort? Uh, uh, it, he 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 accomplished a huge amount on a shoestring budget, but but he was on the ballot. So now to try to do a writing campaign, you need even more of an effort. Uh, and, and the question is going to be whether he can get some money behind him, either through campaign contributions, which if people haven't maxed out, they ought to consider doing that or through an independent expenditure effort. Uh, and, and that's, that's an issue. That's a thought that I know some people have had, uh, and, uh, and, and may show up during, during, uh, the cycle campaign. So, he has a chance if he can get some money behind it. At the, the election, the primary show, there's a lot of discontent with Machecki. Uh, when you expand the voter pool to include uh, uh, Democrats and, and independents that didn't otherwise vote in the – or libertarians that didn't otherwise have the chance to vote uh, in the Republican primary, uh, Ron has a chance. So, But it's going to depend upon the, – the other thing about Ron is that could be – there's a scenario under which that's the key race – that, that preserves the PFD. Why? Because the Senate is otherwise headed toward cutting the PFD. I mean, you look at things that Senator von Inhofe has said, you know, likely Senator Birch has said, uh, they're, they're, they're going to cut the PFD to zero before they do any sort of other revenue uh, options. And they've not been real strong on cutting spending. They've both, both voted for these higher budgets. Um, so you sort of extrapolate that to the remainder of the Senate and, and, you know, you can see the PFDs in danger in the Senate, regardless of who we have for governor. You can you can make a case if you do the numbers. You can make a case that there's the potential for a third caucus, Democrat caucus, uh, uh, establishment Republican caucus, and then a Valley-led, fiscally conservative caucus. You've already seen the part part of that with with Shower stepping out or being a part of the caucus, Shelley Hughes stepping out of the caucus, Laura probably will be be outside the caucus. You can see the potential for that. If you do the numbers, uh, Ron Gillum could, could really uh, be a big big addition to that. All right, Brad Keithley is our guest. It is the Michael Luke Show. You're on for Common Sense Radio. We're finishing up here. Normally we don't carry folks over a couple breaks, but uh, this stuff is so important I could not help not to. Brad plus Brad and I have had a hard time breaking our habits of sitting down and talking for an hour at a time, <laughs> uh, You know, which is good. I think we're probably going to end up doing an unplugged podcast here uh, in the near future, which, by the way, Patreon uh, supporters and Common Sense Core members will get early access to uh, probably by a, a, a couple few days uh, to get a chance to see that. So if you want to uh, you want to do part of that, go out and check out the Michael Duke Show website at MichaelDukeShow.com and click on Join the Core. Brad, before we went to break, uh, again, I kind of uh, laid the question out there for you. It was going to be originally one of your weekly top three what has to happen with the budget in the state of Alaska to keep the PFD long term? Now, to set it up, we remember the governor out there. He had the flow charts. He had the big poster behind him with the airliner crashing into the ground and all this other kind of stuff about how the PFD was going to be drained dry and nobody would get anything. Of course, that was based on flawed assumptions, lack of input back into the permanent fund. I mean, there was just so many things that were wrong with that whole thing. But what do we need to do? with the budget to keep the PFD long-term um, go? Well, it, it's, it's actually a very simple thing. We need to get the budget in balance. It needs to, the budget needs to be sustainable without pulling from the PFD, without, without leading the legislature uh, to, to treat the PFD as just another fiscal reserve uh, and pull from it in order to support the budget. That means two things. One, we need to implement Hammond 50-50, no, which is to use a portion of uh, the, the, the flow of money from earnings uh, to help support government. That goes all the way back to Governor Hammond. He originally talked about you know, 50 percent, half, half of the earnings stream would be used to, uh, essentially to support the PFD. The other half would be available to government when, uh, when government was no longer – when oil was no longer sufficient to fund government. So we need to implement – uh, Hammond 50-50 and get that flow of additional funds 
uh, coming back into government. Uh, but the second thing is then a very simple thing. We need to cut spending uh, down to uh, a level that is supported by uh, uh, sustainable oil numbers, looking over the long term, the ups and the downs, sort of what that what cuts through the middle of all that uh, and builds reserves when we have high oil prices and, and uses those reserves when we have low oil prices. Get that sustainable budget number, add in the Hammond 50-50 number, and keep government spending to that level. Build a sustainable budget based upon those two things uh, without reliance on cutting the PFD. And by the way, in terms of sustainable government, you need one that refills, it takes money out, and refills the CBR for the reasons we just covered in the last segment. If you do that, if you implement Hammond 5050, and if you get spending uh, aligned to the long-term sustainable revenue level, then there's no pressure on the PFD. There's no reason to go pull from uh, the PFD. Frankly, if you can't do that, if you can't get uh, government spending aligned to the long-term sustainable level, then regardless of what we do uh, going forward, there's going to be continued pressure uh, on the PFD. You're going to have the top 20% saying, oh, don't tax us, income tax bad, don't tax us, go tax everybody else through PFD cuts, go tax the other 80% through PFD cuts. If you can't get government, if you can't get government on a sustainable budget, we're going to continue to have that pressure, sort of regardless of who's government, governor, and regardless of what of what fiscal approach we're going to taking. There's going to be people who always want to come in uh, and cut the PFD to, to support those spending levels. So it's simple: uh, implement Hammond 5050 and get spending aligned with long-term sustainable revenue levels, taking into account the need to refill the CBR. Uh, the the devil's in the details of doing it, but those are the two overriding principles. So when you listen to candidates or when you listen to candidates for governor or candidates for the legislature, those are the two things that you're listening for. One, Hammond 50-50, and two, uh, getting uh, uh, long-term spending levels aligned with uh, 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 revenues, that, that uh, traditional revenues coming from uh, oil on a sustainable level uh, over the long term. So simple. It's such a simple solution. Now, if we could only implement it. <laughs> In the chat room, uh, somebody says, could we put the government's 50% of the earnings reserve into the CBR instead of putting it back into the corpus for inflation proofing? Give me a 20 second answer on this, Brad. Oh, we could. Yeah, we can. Um, I, I, it, the, the numbers get sort of, get sort of, uh, uh, Weird. We don't. I mean, so the CB is the 50 percent. The other 50 percent is producing more than we need to be putting back into the CBR. So there's a portion of that we can be using to support government. But you, you need to take both into account. Right. Um, right. Uh, uh, going forward. Brad Keithley, Alaskans for a Sustainable Budget. You can find him on Facebook. Links are, in fact, at the top of the Facebook page where we're broadcasting the video this morning. MichaelDukeShow.com slash Excuse me, Facebook.com slash Michael Duke Show. Brad Keithley, as always, my friend, it is a pleasure to speak with you, uh, and we look forward to seeing uh, what else you got coming up later on this week. Hopefully you and Dunleavy get that conversation going and we can get it done. <laughs> Great, Michael. Thanks Thanks for having me, as always. Appreciate it. Uh, Brad Keithley, again, uh, Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. Facebook is the best place to find him on that. Well, that's a wrap for another week's edition of the Weekly Top 3 from Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. Thank you again for joining us. Remember that you can find past episodes on our YouTube and SoundCloud pages and keep track of us during the week on Facebook and Twitter. This has been Brad Keithley, Managing Director of Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. We look forward to you joining us again next week on the Weekly Top 3.